Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to say welcome to tonight's presentation. Um, it's not midweek, but we are here on the Tuesday um, with Marvin Gabula again, who will be presenting um, this topic, how to buy your first property investment. And this is part two. In our last session, Marvin, we had some excellent feedback. There was a lot of questions. There was a lot of um, comments. And um, we saw that people were really encouraged by the presentation that was given. Marvin, could you just give a, a brief introduction of who you are, what you do, um, your work, your company, in fact, if you could maybe just let people know about that right now. Yes, sure. Um, my name is Marvin Kabula. Um, I'm, the, I'm the managing director for um, just a number of companies uh, in a um, called Rodo Inc. Holdings, which is my holding company that owns uh, my estate agency. So I, I put it an estate agency, uh, a company that just does property management and lettings. And we also, from time to time, do sales. But, um, um, you know, we've got just a few properties that we sell. We, we, our, our main area especially is property management. And then I also own developments. So really with Rodo Development, to those that have been probably been on um, Homes Under the Hammer, you might have seen me there a couple of times. Um, I think I've got another four more episodes to come in, come in on the Hammer. And I also own another company called Rodo Housing and Support. We look after vulnerable children. And um, yeah, that, that, that is uh, my, uh, my, my, my first, I suppose, First, first, first passion really in terms of uh, looking after vulnerable children because I believe that it is our calling to look after the vulnerable people and if we can support and be role models and mentors for them, uh, I think that's, that is what God expects of us. So that is my main, main business. But in terms of properties, uh, I'm very passionate about properties, development and purchasing them and, and learning from, 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 from others as well who've been down the road uh, and share also uh, my experiences with others. I also own another company called Advent Advent Inc. And you can you can understand we can just pick it up from the name Advent is from our Adventist uh, background, but it's called Advent Inc. So it's a software company where we provide um, software um, solutions for uh, companies in health and social care. Um, uh, I'm a married man, father of two. I'm married and a husband to one wife. So yes. And I've been married, I've been with my wife 20 years. So that's a very long time. Wow. It's a very long time. Wow, wow, wow. But, Thank um, you. It's still, still here, still enjoying it. And uh, praise be to God. Definitely. Praise God. I mean, yeah, I didn't know about the Advent Inc. I think that's amazing to, to have that offering software solutions. Um, so tonight, Marvin, uh, we're going to be going over, for those actually, just before I begin that, for those of you who are here that weren't able to make the first session, you are able to catch up or have a recap, if you'd like, from our first session. You can get that on YouTube, um, the NEC Youth's YouTube page, and you can also, or you can watch it on Facebook on the videos that have been uploaded there. Today, um, Marvin, you're going to be talking about constraints, who's involved when we're purchasing a property, finding the right home, getting ready to make the offer. Um, after the acceptance and if we've got time we may take more questions but I'm guessing that there'll be a good amount of questions from the presentation anyway so we'll we'll deal with that today I'm really looking for the, the for looking forward to the presentation um, but before we begin let's say a word of prayer and then I'll hand it over to you let's pray dear lord we thank you so much for the privilege of prayer we thank you for the opportunity to come together um, for these practical sessions that the, you've allowed to take place on the North England Conference Youth Department's um, pages and the channels on Zoom. Father, it's opened up opportunities for people to come together to just gain that practical advice and help where needed. Today, we're dealing and we're talking about how to buy your first property investment, and it's part two. And Father, I pray that those who are participating in the Zoom call and those that may watch on YouTube afterwards, um, that this will serve to help them make the right decisions when buying a property or investing in land or whatever it may be. Uh, we thank you again for this. Uh, be with Marvin as he presents and answers the questions today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 
Yeah, Marvin, so I'll hand over to you. So, uh, good evening, everybody, and um, welcome. And thank you for allowing me to come into your spaces wherever you guys are. And I hope that today or this evening we will look at the part two. Part two of our presentation, really, pretty much today, we are focusing on, uh, on, on, on the constraints. Uh, we're looking at who is involved when you're buying your first property. And we are looking um, at uh, what to do to find the right home. And I hope um, this will answer a few questions, if not create a few questions, and uh, will take us to the next level. But I hope that this, this, this is something that all of us will understand, that it is a general overview. It's not anything bespokely tailored to anybody, but should you want to, um, to have something bespoke to you because you are getting to property or buy your first property, um, my details and my PS details will be at the end of the presentation and we'll be quite happy to support and help you go through the process, uh, which is an awesome experience. And, and, and it, 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 you know, it's an exhilarating experience to anybody who goes into property for the first time. And I hope that anybody who's going to be encouraged tonight uh, will be helped and enabled and encouraged to take the first step. So, so yeah, um, the first things first that we'd like to, to, to talk about this evening is that anybody considers buying properties, there's always things to do. What sort, what sort of things do you have to what sort of does one have to be thinking of, of buying a So the first one, what are the costs involved in buying a house? Now, you can imagine that if you are going to be buying a house, you will need to uh, have uh, sufficient funds to pay for your solicitors, uh, sufficient funds to pay for any disbursements. So I will go into the jargon uh, breaking um, just to clarify what I mean by disbursements and what sort of disbursements we're talking about, um, what sort of uh, conveyancing. Uh, right. So just to read, just to go back just a little bit. So in terms of the costs involved when you're buying a property, you will have obviously have to consider your solicitor's costs. Your solicitor's costs, that's your conveyancer. Uh, your conveyancer, basically what conveyancing basically means is the process, uh, is the process of um, um, seeing through your property you buy it. So this will include searching, this will include your banking process. Everybody who buys you who are a lender using a lender you have to be checked uh, in terms of your identity just for uh, money laundering purposes and also so that you are the proper person just uh, as according to the law and the law what they so those are the disbursements that would be expected now as you consider buying a property one would also need to consider a house or a property that you buy has running costs. So what are, so what are the running costs that we're talking about here? We're talking about um, that will be your mortgage payments, that will be paying for your utilities, uh, paying for your repairs, should you have your repairs, uh, your insurances, uh, which are really pretty much mandatory because if you're gonna have a property, you will need to have your buildings insurance. You will need to have your contents insurance. Uh, just to keep again, a buildings insurance is what covers your, your fixed fixtures, your bricks and mortar, and any other fixtures that are not movable within the property. So it is very important that you consider that when you buy a property, you have your buildings insurance. Ultimately, you also would need to have a life insurance cover. The various insurance covers that one has to consider buying, and it includes uh, the, the one that reduces as you make payments. So the as you make so, for example, if you took a 250,000 uh, mortgage or lending, what you will find is that uh, when you have a when you make repayment, your policy also goes down as your capital repayment goes down. So those are the type of costs and many other costs. Maybe should you consider um, refurbing your property or having the risk of incidentals, uh, those are the types of running costs that one will need to consider. So as I mentioned before, insurances, buildings, and life cover, very important. 
contents insurance, as I mentioned, is very important. Um, repairs, home cover. Nowadays, it's very easy to have covers such as, um, you can have companies such as Home Save, got your boiler covers. Um, a Home Save will provide your, uh, also your plumbing cost as well. So those are the things that one needs to uh, be mindful of uh, as constraints when you buy your property. Now, stamp duty. This is a this is a this is a big one, but if you are a fair buyer, uh, it would be something that would not probably that. Just to let you know, as of um, the the government has changed the, the 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 scope in terms of the amount of money that one would have to return in stamp duty. Whereas before, if you were a first-time buyer, uh, you had about almost 125,000 um, pounds of, um, of, of, you know, of stamp duty exemption, but now it's actually even gone more. So those who are buying property, 500,000, between 500,000 to a million pounds, uh, you're looking at 5%. If you are buying a property which is under 500,000, you're looking at 2%. So those are the type of uh, stamp duty costs that one would have to consider. What is stamp duty, by the way? Uh, if I may ask that question, stamp duty is tax on a property. Usually, if you're a first time buyer, you tend to be uh, exempted. But if you're looking at a second property as an, as, as an investment property, the liability of stamp duty is more. Now, you think of it that, look, you know, when you buy property, you, you, you have to deal with various agencies, various people, various organizations, and various entities who will help you through your journey. So these include your agents and, and, and auctions or auctioneers. Now, your agents are the ones that tend to advertise the properties uh, where you find them in various property portfolios. Uh, which we mentioned in the pre previous presentation, where we mentioned that you've got the likes of Zoopla, the likes of Prime Location, and the products of Right Move, um, um, on market, and all things. Those are the types of um, agents or agencies where you will find properties. And there are also, as well, uh, properties as well that you can pick up from auctions. I like buying properties from auctions because it gives me an opportunity to, to handle. Now it depends on what time you would have gone. If you buy, if you make a good offer, or you buy it at a very good time, you buy a property, um, not necessarily next to nothing, but you can buy it cheaper, depending on who's bidding against you. Solicitors. Solicitors are very important because those are your conveyances. So those are the ones who would do the due diligence. As I mentioned, that they will look into your disbursements. Uh, your, uh, your title or your deeds entries with the land registry. So they are very important and they play a critical role. Uh, they also and the lenders ensuring this thing. When, when monies need to be transferred uh, to the vendor, the vendor is the one who's selling a the ones that will hold your funds. They will also like to check a uh, proof of funds as well, where your money is coming from, whether they've got, you get evidence of the deposits and get evidence of uh, uh, your lender or whether you've got a mortgage agreed uh, on your part. Surveyors. So surveyors, what you'll find, my experience will be through your lender. A lender is a page or um, and, and the process is going through is all in surveyors. Now, there is also a constraint there. When surveyors are instructed, you have the responsibility of paying surveyors. Now, here within the Midlands, we have uh, various companies. The ones that I, I tend to use is a company called Vaz Panel, uh, and you have to pay 295 pounds to go and do an evaluation. So they do an evaluation report and send that to your lender just to confirm what the value of the property projected to. So that's very, very important. Your mortgage lenders, as I mentioned last time, that you've got your high street lenders, only your private companies who also provide mortgages. So don't be tied down to just checking what the high street lender would offer you, because there are some lenders who are not on the street who will still equally provide you with very good offer. And obviously the property, uh, the person who owns the property, and that's the vendor, uh, that's the person who is involved. Finding the right home. Now, that's, that's, that's a very interesting one, isn't it? We all want to find the right home. 
And usually they say somebody has to move about eight to 10 times before they find the right home. That is if before you buy your property, but there are certain things that work to find uh, the right home. Let's look at those. So what should I consider in knowing uh, what I want in a home? What I always say is that there's a lot of things to consider. Uh, you look at amenities, you look at the crime levels, you look at um, the convenience to work, uh, family, uh, you look at the schools around, um, and you look at crime. So if there's, the area is, is quite, quite good in terms of, the, of, those, uh, of those issues, then you are more, more likely to make a good decision. And also as well, uh, the postcode. The postcode is very important. What people need to understand about the postcodes is that various postcodes can actually indicate how much a property is. And, and they, they, they actually give you an indication in terms of uh, property values. So what I always encourage everybody to do is that if you are considering buying a property, always check. Um, there's a little website I like to go to myself, which is um, Check My Street. So it will tell you the, the demographs and it will give you all the in the area, be it crime, be it how much the previous properties were sold for. So you have an idea how much in that particular area um, those properties are worth. Price and affordability. That's also one of the most important things. So when you are considering the right home, always consider the price. Do not chew or do not uh, chew what you can, more than you can swallow. Because if you take a bigger, bigger mortgage, uh, it can affect you on affordability. So it's always important that you check your, affo your affordability tool just to see if you are uh, in a position to maintain and uh, cope with the repayments. As I mentioned before, areas or amenities, work, schools, church. Church is very important. Some people like to be close to church so that then it's not a, a long distance to travel and also as well to be able to fellowship with the brethren that live locally and around. Family, rural. Uh, some people like to consider, would consider being in a rural place um, as the best place to be. I live in a place which is semi-rural and um, we like it as a family because we were pretty much out um, and where we are is quiet and we're able to take walks and um, we prefer it that way because it gives us peace and quiet. So as I mentioned, checkmystreet.com is a very good website of checking uh, the demographics and the issues around the properties if you're considering uh, finding the right home for yourself. Now, getting ready to make an offer. Now, this is a very interesting one. Now, this is where the journey begins because we are assuming here that you would have had an opportunity to view your property. You would have had an opportunity to go back again for the second time and you would have had a very good property. So how do you get ready to make uh, an offer? Uh, let's, get it, let's get into that. So it is always important that before you make an offer, do what we call an agreement, a lending agreement in principle. What is an, an agreement in principle? An, an agreement in principle, in short, it refers, um, it refers uh, to what you are allowed to borrow. So excuse my, excuse my typo there, uh, but it it's basically refers to what you are allowed to borrow. Now, when somebody has an, a, a mortgage agreement in principle, it makes them very, very attractive when you decide to make an offer or if somebody was to come to me and they want to buy one of my properties that i'm, I'm offloading or selling uh, and they've got a mortgage agreement or a mortgage in principle to me they are so attractive because i know already the offer and that offer can actually be seen through so it's always important that when you do consider uh, to make an offer try and get a mortgage offer in school uh, but if you are quite confident in terms of your credit rating and you don't have any any costs under the under the under the shelves or under the carpet by all means you can make an offer and if your offer is accepted you have the following so you'll be provided with what is called a, um, a memorandum of purchase but we'll come into that in a little while so it is, it is a stepping stone to a mortgage, as I mentioned, that in, in agreement or a mortgage a principle, it is the stepping stone to a mortgage. So how to go about making a perfect pitch or a bid for a house? Now, never appear desperate, never appear desperate. So if you're considering making an offer or a pitch or a bid for a house, the way you should always come across uh, present, it is not the only property that you are viewing. 
because when you present the give an impression to the vendor that oh this is the only property that you are interested in chances are that you are going to be a very very easy person to be manipulated by them but if you demonstrate that look you know what you're looking at various you're looking at various options and you could consider the price uh, the house if it comes with a good good price also always ask as well uh, find out what the property comes with um, and, and check also as well um, if um, how flexible the lender are trying to make just you know make your offer very low. That's what I always so low entry level in terms of offer is always a, a good advice. So how to negotiate? Now to negotiate on properties, I wouldn't say it's very easy, but there's certain things that one can learn when you're thinking of negotiating in terms of buying a property. Like I mentioned before make sure that you do not offer the asking price check what other properties are going for in that local area usually what the vendor is that they will be related to ensure that they can maximize on that so it's always important that you check what other properties so you check uh, on on the websites i've given you that the right move the zoo plus they will tell you they'll give you the, they'll give you the desktop evaluation so it's called the desktop evaluation when you put up an address on zoopla and type in the postcode it's a desktop evaluation it's not a full evaluation but it gives you a very good picture of what uh, the property is worth so what happens after i accept an offer Usually, after, you've, uh, after your offer has been accepted, the vendor, through the agent who brokers the deal between yourself and the vendor, they will draw what they call a memorandum of, memorandum of purchase or a memorandum of sale. You need to sign that. That can go to your lender, and you can also provide that to your solicitor. Then that starts the process. Then that starts showing them that you are pretty serious about what you want to do, and you are really committed towards going towards uh, the journey so that's really really important so always ensure you have a memorandum of purchase or a memorandum of uh, of sale drawn because that then uh, when you take it to any mortgage lender they know that you're not a tire kicker you're not there to waste time but also as well the situation is different if you were buying a property uh, on an auction floor on an auction floor there is never an opportunity of a memorandum of uh, sale. Once the gavel goes down, uh, the property is yours and you will have your exchange contracts on the day. So we'll come on to the exchanging of contracts. Uh, it's a little bit different within when you buy a property from an auction as opposed to when you buy a property from um, an estate agency or when it's being sold uh, on the property portal uh, on purple bricks uh, if you like uh, when you buy through those there's very little pressure as opposed to an auction floor an auction floor would ha would have specifics some of them when you buy properties uh, a vendor can put a specific instruction on the contract to say that they need the property to be completed within 14 days 21 days or 28 days failing to do that you're saved with the notice to complete and you may find yourself in a very, very situ difficult situation. And I trust me, I've been through those situations where it gets pressured because uh, once you're saved with the notice to complete, you fail to complete, you lose your money. So there are monies to be lost. But whereas if you're buying through the normal channel, uh, which is what I would recommend everybody if you haven't got uh, you know, you know, money available, um, try and go through the normal channel. When, you're, when you've got cash, Auction is also a good uh, option to, to, to explore. Right, acceptance of contracts. If you have a very good solicitor, now good companies, they practice, and they are governed by uh, the, uh, the, 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 the law society. So now they will not allow you to exchange contracts until they have given you reports on, uh, on on disbursements reports on uh on searches searches on water uh sewer checks uh searches on boundaries confirmation on title deeds on the boundary of your land and uh just checking if there's anything untoward on uh the title and covenants restrictive covenants what you can and cannot do on a property or on land so there are some properties so it's always important that when you are buying a property whether you're buying it through an auction whether you're buying it through the normal always check the legal document so the the, the con conveyances that's what they're there for 
They check all of those things for you, tell you about all hidden things that are on the properties because there are some properties who, who when you purchase them, if they've got uh, restrictive covenants, there's things that you can and cannot do in properties. That's something to be very mindful of. Surveying and change. Someone did ask a question about uh, what, 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 what is a chain? Now, a chain simply refers to a situation where uh, one, before one completes their need. So it's two individuals here who are, who, who are purchasing properties simultaneously. So while I'm waiting to complete, I'm waiting, for, or while you're waiting for me to complete, you're waiting for me to complete and make, a, and make payments of the fund so that then you're, you are also able to buy your own property. So we are waiting for me to complete so that you are able to move on. Okay, so how long can you expect to wait before getting keys in your hand? Now, it all depends. It all depends. If you are in a chain, it does take a while. And I can tell you a very good example. Uh, in my case, uh, my home, when I was purchasing our home, um, it took us about 10 to, 10 to 11 months. That's how long it took for us to complete from the start of the process to the end. Whereas if you are not in a chain, attractive individual because then you are able to complete without having to wait for somebody to buy your property if it's your first one and if you want to complete on a property always ask a question are you in a chain are you waiting to complete with myself so that you move out because that in turn does affect uh, your ability to get keys on time okay so again Anybody who may be interested again in contacting us and getting to know more, if you want us to help you have something bespoke, if you can't get through to me, there's my email address, or you can contact Lisette Ngube, who's my PA. She'll be gladly and she'll be more than happy and uh, uh, she'll be happy to assist and point you in the right direction. So I'm quite happy to take some questions here, Craig, if uh, there's any questions to be uh, taken. Okay, perfect. Thanks again, Marvin. That was um, um, excellent. I'm looking forward to some of the questions that may come in. For those of you... I tried I try to stick to half an hour. <laughs> I, I'm so glad I did 29 minutes, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did well. You did well. Um, those of you that may want to ask a question, if you just type the question in the chat section and um, we'll put them forward. Um, there are some questions that I've got, Marvin. Yes, so please. when you know like when i was moving i used the same thing my streets and mm. it helped a lot um but there are times it was you know nearly every street that we'd look at if there was a, a problem in a house if it was ever reported to the police it would make it look as if that's not a street to go on but mm -hmm. we found some streets were really silent they were really quiet and and everything was okay what do you look for when on my street to help you know, okay, even though there's been an incident recorded, it's still okay to go there? Well, I, here's the thing. We live, we live in a real world, and even the most uh, quiet areas, they do have crimes. But I think what one has to consider is to consider the prevalence, the prevalence of the crimes occurring if it was crimes you were looking into if it was vehicle thefts mm -hmm. if it was uh, house breakings just look at the privilege because it will give you and the good thing is whenever it's recorded there that shows that crime is being recorded and there is something that's being done about it as opposed to a very silent area but i would say look at the prevalence and the gaps between uh, and the complaints and what's been done to reduce if it's crime, if it's social privation, if it's uh, issues relating to schools, if it's issues relating to uh, uh, whether it's general practices or doctors and stuff like that. So all that information is there, but it's always there to help you make a decision. Okay, okay. So mystreet.com. Thank you. Um, agreement in principles. Mm -hmm. where, where can you go to get them? I've seen them on... on banking websites but where where should you go should you use your own bank or should you try and get agreements in principles with different vendors how what should you do and i think that's the choice that one has to make and you know what i always say what i always say to people is that when people are considering um 
you know, making or having an agreement in principle given them. Consider the interest rates that, a, you know, a particular lender you're going for would be charging. Uh, consider also as well the reviews on that particular lender because there are some lenders who are very, very, very difficult to get into, but you realize that in, in the process that they're very, very draconian in the way they do things. But I, I always say that when you are looking to get for a mortgage in principle, it's just which lender can it still shop around. Don't stick with only just one. Uh, you can only go to two, three, four, and they can give. Because remember, mortgage in principle, they do what they call, uh, they do what we call soft credit checks. So the soft credit checks mm -hmm. do not uh, impact on your credit file. They, 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 they are just there to just show whether you are eligible to get one. So I would say shop around and see if you get as many, but uh, ideally just shop around and see if you can get one who can provide you with the best offer. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, here's another one, new build property. Should you get new build property or an older property or does it really matter? Okay, I am, um, I don't know, uh, my personal opinion, uh, um, I, 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 I believe in all, I believe in old properties and, and usually old properties where pro when, when they build old properties in the olden days, that's when they build properties to last. Yeah. These newer properties that they're doing, um, you know, a property can be done and built within uh, a week, a week done. Top marks a week is done. Property is built. Now you ask yourself a question. Is that property going to last a long time? Chances are, yes, they would last a long time because technology and building and building systems have changed. So I would not critique, but if, you, if that question was asking my personal view, I prefer old properties. I mean, my, with my own personal home, I live in a property which was built in 1850. So, mm -hmm. so, so you can tell that, look, that there's character for me. And the more you, you, the more you look into character, the more you would prefer old properties as opposed to new ones. But again, that doesn't necessarily mean that new properties don't hold value. But what you'll find is that all the properties do tend to hold value and do tend to last a long time. Mm -hmm. you, I mean, I totally understand what you mean. <laughs> Some of the properties now, if you knock the wall hard enough, you're, you're in the next door neighbor's house. Absolutely, plasterboard, uh, yeah. plasterboard on walls. And, and there's again, you know, it's, it's, it, I suppose it's, it's preference. Some people prefer the new build. So I don't want anybody walking away thinking, oh, you know, we need to buy old property. No, it's your preference. If your preference, you like the modern look and something that looks really, really new, uh, go for it. Uh, but the most important, is always, most important point is always going to be about affordability. Can you afford being in that type of property? Should that property develop issues or has issues? Are you in a position to be able those are the kind of things that one need to consider okay perfect all right so we've got some more questions that are coming in now um so here's one would you recommend buying a house or buying land and constructing a house for a first-time buyer again it depends on resources um you know i would say that if you are asking me personally about that I would say buy a complete article. Buy that. When I say complete article, I mean buy a house because the idea behind it is that it saves you time. If it's the first time that you're buying a property and you're buying land and you're looking to get a development loan, what you'll find is that you're going to have to find the right builder. Now, builders are very difficult. Good builders are very difficult. You know, we see a lot of contractors, we see a lot of builders, but the very good ones that hold a good fabric of integrity are very difficult to buy. Now, if it's your first time, you will be on for a high ride because they will give you a very, very difficult road. But I would recommend that if it's your first time buying, buy a complete article, then, then, then look at augmenting that with other investment properties as you go along because you would have had enough experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, what, what's a good minimum amount you need for a deposit for a two bed in an, in an okay area in Birmingham? I think 
it's all about affordability. Um, if you were looking at a place, a great bar, I, I, I class area like Great Bar, very, very good. Eddington is a very good place in Birmingham. Uh, Edge Boston is a very good place in Birmingham. Southern Caulfield is a very good place in Birmingham, but it depends on what size property you're looking for. Now, again, it is all dependent on what you can afford. Nowadays, like we did in, if you, if, if you have seen our first presentation, we did speak that now, uh, whereas before, uh, lenders would be looking for five to ten percent. The landscape has changed. The landscape has changed because of the current pandemic situation we're going into or we are into at the moment because the lending appetite at the moment is dampened. So you may find that if you're looking for a property, uh, anything worth around about £210,000, you have to have minimum at least 25 to 30% deposit, which talks about almost 50 to £52,000. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't still buy a property without a deposit because there are some developers out there. If you look for developers, you may find that there are schemes where you can get help to buy schemes. And I'm going back on the presentation that we did before. Yeah. You may find that there are schemes where you can go in at entry level 10%, and you can pay that 10% or pay 5% or even get 100% without needing to pay any deposit. And all what you would have to pay is the constraints that we spoke about earlier, which include your, 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 your disbursements, your convincing fees, your stamp duties, depending on the value of the property that you'll be looking into. Mm -hmm. I, do, I do remember you mentioning this in the last presentation. And I think you were saying that it's best to give more than the minimum amount to give as much as possible because it absolutely because it, it 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 the beauty of putting a lot in terms of of putting a higher deposit it reduces your outlay in terms of your monthly payments mm -hmm. and always remember when you take any form of lending get the best mortgage deal available i always say to people if it's your first property Avoid getting an interest only because all you have to, all you'll be doing is servicing interest and you're not denting on the capital. But if you're looking for a capital repayment, you will need to make sure that you're, you've got a very good deposit that will in turn, you know, drop down your repayments. But again, over a period of time, you've got equity. Those are other things that you can explore should you want to go to the next level in terms of property investment. Okay. You mentioned in the presentation uh, this this point about surveillancing and the chain. Yes. Um, the questions come in as to how do you reduce your chain size or I guess in the length of time um, when purchasing a property? I think if we are to be brutally honest and be really straight with each other in terms of straight talk, try and avoid uh, a property with a chain. Just just simply avoid it. Don't touch it. because. If you are intending to buy and turn, or have a good, a quick turnaround on a property purchase, a, a chain will take you a long time. Because what happens with the chain is this, that you can only complete if the vendor who you're buying the property from completes on the other one, or has an assurance that you've exchanged contracts then they can complete on the other property that they're purchasing. Failing that, you are stuck and it will take you a long time. Does that mean that uh, I had a chain with my home? We were fine waiting for our home because it was, it was, it was a place that we really, really wanted and we were quite happy to wait. We, did, we were not in a rush. But if it's your first time, purchase, purchase, avoid to purchase a property on a chain. Okay. I'm guessing it it can just cause unwanted headache in the long run. It, it, it's stressful. It's, it's stressful. Yeah. Ending. Never ending. Itself, then you're just you're just waiting for ages. What if you're yeah, the you're waiting for ages until somebody? Yeah. What if you're the person who's needing to wait to sell before you can buy a property? What what then? Is there anything that they could actively do? Say, 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 the, say the question again, Craig. So what if you are the person who's waiting to sell? Yeah, before you can take the, the property from the person. And again, and that's, that's a different situation because here we're assuming that you, already, you are already in a property. But I think for a first-time buyer, for somebody who's buying the property for the first time, try and avoid buying a property uh, in a chain because if it's a chain, uh, for me, as a first-time buyer, it won't be that attractive. 
depending on what type of property it is and how how, you know, how desperate I am to, you know, I'm, you know, whether am I willing to wait for that property? If I'm that desperate, then that might mean that probably that property might not be appealing because I have to wait. But then if you're the one waiting to complete in order to be able to sell, then there's nothing that you can do. You're in a cash 20, 24 on that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, how, how do you know who are the best estate agents to join in? To, to join within your area? And, and how do you find out who to go with? Um, th th that question is very difficult to, 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 to answer. It's it best is that agents to join in terms of what? In terms of buying a property or in terms of letting your property and having your property managed? It, 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 clarity on that one. But if it's buying a property, really, what you need is, is just the property. Now the broker, the agent, the agent is there to broker a deal, and and you are quite clear with your specifics in terms of what you want, the price you're willing to pay, the very fact that I'm not on a chain, I'm a first-time buyer, that makes me very attractable. I've got a mortgage lending in principle. Really, the the agent is there just to broker a deal. Um, I really wouldn't be quite bogged down on what agent it is as long as the property is good and it's what I'm interested in. Because a good agent, or a good estate agent, would have good properties and they would have done it for a while. So really, I wouldn't be worried too much about that. It's about identifying the property that you're interested in. Yeah, yeah. The, um, which, which is more cost effective, someone's asking, renting or buying? I, I know you talked about this before in the previous presentation. Mm -hmm. Maybe just a quick brief explanation on this for the person who's asking. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think you know, I, I this, I learned this after a while that look, you know, some people prefer to rent because it's uh, it's cheaper, it's easier to move from a property to another property. Um, when you've got just a tenancy agreement, when it expires, you can move. Uh, now, when you have a property that you own. Um, it's not as easy as that unless if you're deciding to move from a property and you put a tenant in. But for me, I always look at it this way, that anybody who pays rent or anybody who's renting, it's dead money. It's yeah. dead money. You are just paying for, ten for tenure uh, to utilize, for tenure in, 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 in a property. It's, it's your time in a property. What if you use that 750 pounds to pay for your own property that you have and what that does is that you gain equity on that particular property. So it's never money lost. You're servicing uh, a charge on a property, which is a mortgage. Um, and eventually that money will, will come to you at some point and you can benefit out of that. With, with anything that you are leasing or you're renting, really the benefit is just, just minimal, if any. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, there's the estate agents that, that you have to deal with. But what about the solicitor? How do you, what makes a good, reputable housing solicitor? Um, you check on the reviews, check on the reviews. There are some good firms out there who will ensure that they've got your, they've got your back, uh, to just to use a loose term. Um, they will ensure that due diligence is done. They're just not just taking you on as a client, uh, just to, uh, just to, just to, you know, Turn, turn it around and they make money out of you. So really it's always important that when you're checking, just check the reviews on solicitors. And even when they do send you any client care letters, go through their client care letters and see exactly what they list on client care letters about what they do. And it's always important, look at their costs, look at their fees. Some solicitors would have hidden fees. So you may find a client care letter instructing them to uh, 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 assist you in the conveyancing, but be shocked and get shocked at the end of it, realize there are certain costs that they're actually extending over to you. And especially some solicitors, and I'm not saying all of them, some of them who are, who are, who are dubious and who are, suspect, who are suspect, they will always prey on first-time buyers because first-time buyers are impressionable. And, and they will tell you that they will do this, but a good solicitor will justify their fees. You will know that if there are disbursements for doing ID checks, for, for doing bankruptcy, a bankruptcy check just costs two pounds. 
they will list the cost of two pounds for a bankruptcy, bankruptcy check, for verifying your ID, two pound 50, for, 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 for checking what remains in train. They will list all of that. And you'll find that on average, on average, you may pay anything within 500 to 650 or even up to 900 pounds um, uh, solicitor's fee in terms of convincing. And that for me, those are type of, those are reasonable figures. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, okay. Um, you know, there's times when I've wandered around and I've looked at estate agents looking at properties and I'm seeing what's out there. And there's times where you just see a property that's been on there every single time that you've gone to see. What should, should you ever be concerned or worried about a property that seems to have been listed for a long time? Yeah, um, but what you also find also as well, do not be alarmed because... They, 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 there's, there's a, there's, there are various factors that affect that. When you look at the high-end properties, Craig, those ones that are very, very expensive, and when I say very expensive, I'm talking about properties probably above half a million. Anything above a half a million is not going to sell like hot chips all the time. Really, it attracts a few uh, sect or particular type of people who have that type of uh, uh, cloud or pocket to purchase such properties. Uh, so you'll find that the, ten, the turnaround or the turnover for those properties is not usually as quick. So those properties may last. And I'll give you a very good example. So if you ever look at properties that are sold, uh, if you are in the West Midlands here uh, at Roman Road, Roman Road in Little Aston, uh, those properties, uh, a property worth 2.5 million or three and a half million pounds is not going to sell quicker than a property that's worth about a quarter million, a property that's worth 250,000, 250, 200,000 pounds, that property will probably shift uh, and be bought quicker than that type of property. So really do not be alarmed. But also as well, it may also mean that if the property price is down or is low, uh, the questions to ask is, are there any other hidden things that have been picked up on searches that may have caused other people that have made offers in the past not to want to complete? Because um, put it this way. So uh, there are some properties, especially in the black country. Now, we all know that in the black country, this famous area here in the West Midlands, which has so much history, there's so much heritage around that area in terms of, uh, you know, the mining and, and all those. And there's a property actually that has come up time and time and time again and i've seen it on auction floors that particular property in that area has a history of subsidence uh, it has a history of subsidence and that area has a history of subsidence and with that particular property i've actually uh i've spoken to one 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 solicitor and they said to me that no marvin you need to avoid that property because that property has come through to us and we've done stages more than 17 18 times on it and we've always picked up that that property is subsiding and it will need to be pinned underneath. And that's a huge amount of costs that you may find yourself with. So always, always ensure that you get a very good search report that will enable you to make a good decision. But some properties may stay a long time purely because of the cost. Some may stay a long time because there are hidden issues that have been picked up on searches. So what do you do? I'm just thinking to that, that person who's the first time is, is new to the whole the game of buying a property and um, how would they ever go about finding out about the, the the problem that you just mentioned that that property has yeah do do just do 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 your research to do your research and the beauty about it is this that when you have a surveyors uh a surveyors going to do a surveying uh on a property um you 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 can always ask for a surveyor's report or you can ask to have an independent view or review by an independent surveyor they can actually go and do one and you can get that information so it's always about being informed and it's always about asking questions and knowing who to ask and where to ask and what to ask mm. that is always important that's what makes a difference because always rem remember buying a property is probably going to be one of the biggest decisions you're going to have to make and if you're going to make that decision, make it right and do it right. Ask questions, know who to go to, to get advices. And as I say, if anybody needs anything and need to ask anything, we're I'm quite happy. We're quite happy to assist and support. Yeah, we really appreciate that you've made yourself so available for anybody to, to come and approach you and even ask for mentoring and help and guidance and questions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, 
a question's come in saying, what are some of the things to watch out for in a survey report that may make them say, I don't want to touch the property? Um, again, maybe if at the past, there were issues about drains, um, there were issues about the land being contaminated. And, um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to criticize anybody, but picture this. So if you were to consider buying a property which is next to a fuel, fuel service station, right? So if your property that you're interested in is next to a fuel station, remember that there will always be issues around land contamination. Your surveyors report, your convincing report will pick all of that. That will always affect the price of the property. So should you decide to offload that property when you go ahead or go forward, that's something to, 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 to be aware of. So that's what those surveyors, surveyors reports are or searches are going to be doing. Like I said, if there's issues around uh, drainage or uh, the issues around boundaries, because what you may find is that when, when searches are done, some people tend to extend boundaries on properties when they are not given permission. They don't have the right to do that. But if proper searches are not done, you may find that the lender may probably be very reluctant to lend you money on a property that um, the ground has got contamination on. Um, there's issues around uh, the boundaries if there's been uh, arguments around it. So those are the type of things that you need to be aware of. But those are things that your good solicitor will ensure that they keep you updated and you, they keep you in the know. So it's getting the right people around you. I've heard yes. people give advice and say, buy the worst property on the street and build it up. But that may not always be the best option because you may be in a bigger problem than what you hoped for. And again, also as well, I mean, I, I'll, I'll tell you of a story. So I, uh, when, I, when I first got into this, into this property, we call it the property game, um, I was so, so excited and I was so gullible. Um, I bought a property with a sitting tenant. Now, we will talk about that because I know you did, you did mention this before. So, um, so there, there, there are various types of tenure. So I, when I bought this investment property, it had what we call um, uh, a protected tenancy. Now, these protected tenants were done by Margaret Thatcher. Uh, this is pre-90s. And with protected tenants, you cannot evict them. You cannot ask them to leave properties. You're not allowed. It doesn't matter. And if, it, if I wanted to increase rent on my property, I have to take my, my request to a property tribunal uh, for them to actually sanction and mandate my rental increase. That's something that I had to learn. But if I had known and read the legal paperwork, I would have known and I would have not bought the property. Yeah. Wow, 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 wow. I mean, that leads into a question then because somebody said, um, do you recommend finding houses with apartments that are attached um, as it would be extra income from the tenants? Say again, uh, sorry, I'm missing that question. Yeah, do, do you recommend finding houses with apartments attached seeing it's an extra income from the tenants it's, it's it's up to it's up it's up to anybody i mean if you if you if you're okay with other people living within your space and uh, particularly if they're strangers and you don't have a problem with that why not if it's an extra income that will help you um you know add value gain value on the property and exploit that opportunity by all means you can do so mm -hmm. Okay, um, what about foreclosures? They are, very, they are very good. Now with foreclosures, as I did mention, I think the last time when we spoke, I spoke about the below market value properties. So those are foreclosures. And, 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 and when those properties are, are being sold, when the banks are selling them, they sell them on a bidding system. So if somebody, for example, Craig, if you offered a 250,000, I'm just plucking a figure out of thin air here, um, uh, 250,000 in a property that you've seen in Southern Caulfield and that property is going through foreclosure or it's actually being sold and it's been repossessed by the bank and the bank, because the bank, remember, the bank is not allowed to profiteer on that property. They have been receiving some mortgage repayments. What they are asked to do by the government and by law is to sell it below market value to get their costs, not necessarily to profit out of it. So when they sell that property, they sell it to what we call, we, we call them BMVs, but they sell them on a bidding system. So the bidding system is such that uh, 
if you come in and you offer 250,000 on that property in Southern Caulfield, I have to wait until a certain period, um, or you will have to wait until a certain period to see if there is no one who's offered the counter offer. If someone comes and 75,000, that cycle goes on again until, until there's nobody willing to pay an X amount of money in that property and they take it. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Okay. Um, let's see. As a full-time university student who is renting away from home, how best can I get on the property ladder and save it for a deposit? Okay. Um, Two things here for me. I think we have to be very clear. So if you're a student, the question that any lender would be asking is that, do you have any regular source of income? If you have a regular source of income as a student, you've got a full-time job and you're a student, you're good to go. But obviously, if you are depending on your student loans, um, lenders will be probably quite reluctant to offer you any mortgages uh, because you are deemed and frowned upon as uh, maybe somebody who can possibly be a liability and may probably struggle with repayments. But the best thing to do where you can save as much as you possibly can, do that so that then you keep a very good credit report, a credit record, and, and when you've got a good credit line as a student, as you finish your student, because remember, if you're going to be receiving any monies or government funds uh, as a student, then you come out already with a, with a form of debt. But if you've got a very good credit line, you're in a position uh, or together and added with the deposit that you would have added, you're in a good position to be able to purchase a property. But I, what I would say is that if you're a student, if you can, unless obviously if you are a rich student, then you can purchase a property. Or if you've inherited something, then you can purchase a property. But uh, if you're not uh, maybe perhaps that blessed, I would say wait, finish your course, then you can look at that, but maintain a very good credit line so that then as you finish your course and as you get a good job, you're in a good position to be able to, to buy a property. But don't be afraid to buy a property. And I say this to all our young people that if you have an opportunity, if you've got a deposit, you can, with everything we've shared, you can still buy a property. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, would you, so the, the person who's out there the, the thinking, should I just get a big house in one go? Or should I get a smaller one? What would you recommend as that first property for a family home? Okay, so, 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 so for me, let's, let's look at it logically. A big property means big responsibility. There's big costs, big running costs if it's a big property. So it's 21 hours. It, 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 it all depends on your affordability at the end of the day. If you can afford to maintain, run a big property with all its outlays and running costs, that's fine. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say go buy a small property because I'm not sure of people's circumstances here. Because somebody may, may, they may be able to afford a big property. Somebody may prefer a smaller property because you know what, they prefer to be in a space that they can afford. So it's all based on affordability and what you can afford. Okay. Okay. What about getting a property abroad? Again, Craig, so getting a property abroad. Yeah, let me, let me, I mean, for example, you know, I remember I went to Spain on a holiday and I mm -hmm. saw it was literally like going from cold England to, to warm England. There was just a bunch yeah. of people from England there. And, um, you know, even the, the shops were, uh, you know, you could get a British breakfast there in the mornings, etc. because of the amount of people who have yes. gone out there, they've, they've relocated. How, how, what advice would you give for the person who wants to buy a property abroad? Uh, do your research very well. And who you, you know, the best thing I would say is that, look, there's nothing wrong with buying a property abroad. I, I have properties abroad. And, and what I will say to people is that, look, if you're considering buying a property, know who you're buying the property from. The due diligence is similar as to what you would do here. If you have an agent, if you have an agent, if you have a solicitor over there, just make sure that they've got a good track record. Just get to know that the, whoever is selling a property they've done, they, they will do all the searches, just as how we do searches here, mm -hmm. they will do similar searches there. So, and again, just look for a place where you know that if you are going to be renting that property, uh, you will maximize on returns. 
if it's in a tourist destination or if it's in a it's in a big city you know that your property while you're away is going to be rented as opposed to having a property in a place that maybe perhaps is uh, remote and it's very difficult for people to access that may turn out to be a lot okay 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 um, there's so many things you can do you can give yeah, you can give your property to agents who can manage it for you. Uh, you can uh, have it as a company. Let's go. Nowadays, it's even better still. You can have it as an Airbnb. And uh, if you put it on the Airbnb portal, uh, your property all fully done. And you can have just somebody or uh, just an agent over there who just goes there and make sure that the place is cleaned and is maintained. And it can make money for you. So there's nothing that can stop anybody from uh, buying abroad. But just do your research very well. Know who you're buying the property. Now, one thing that I just need to just highlight highlight especially when you're buying properties abroad if you're buying going to buy a property abroad try and make sure you've done good due diligence around buying properties off plan but that's another conversation again Craig that we'll have in terms of uh, buying properties off plan properties bought off plan are properties that you buy before they get completed and those are cheaper but you, you you'd remember and you recall that in Spain, Spain had a crash in 2008 and seven, uh, and some properties were not completed and people were in a very serious predicament. But, but there are places where you can buy properties off plan and they get to be completed and you buy them cheaper and you can actually use them as very good investments. And remember also as well, it's also possible to get a mortgage abroad. So you can get lenders that can actually give you a mortgage in Spain, a mortgage in Portugal, a mortgage in Dubai, depending uh, on how you manage your affairs here. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, you mentioned Airbnb. Yeah. I know a few people that are doing Airbnbs and oh yeah, oh yeah, it works well for them. And they've got a property that they're literally using as a holiday home. And when they're not there, they're managing it and um, making a bit of income from that too. And also as well, just to just to just to cap on that one as well, get to understand the prop the property laws in an area. Um, just just not too far from us in one of the British Isles in Jersey, the property laws in Jersey are very strict and they're very different from the from from England. So you'll find that if you are um, if you are not a Jersey resident, if you buy a property in Jersey you'll find that Jersey says that you can never live in that property. It's an investment property only. You will never, ever live in that property because that's law. So, so those are things that you just need to get to know what the laws and the rules of the lands are before you can consider uh, uh, pouring your money in because you don't want to purchase a property that may become a very, very uh, difficult white elephant to move. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Um, and I'm guessing also, I mean, we saw with this whole coronavirus situation with the lockdowns, people who had two properties um, were looked down upon by the community if they came into their area and had a mm. property elsewhere. So we saw that that was a bit of an impact as well. Yes, yes. And again, the, 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 this pandemic, remember last week, uh, last time when we spoke, I said that, look, uh, if anybody was considering buying a property, this is the time to buy. Uh, take advantage of a crisis. A crisis always presents opportunities. And this period and this window that we're in during this pandemic period, it's a good buyer's market as opposed to anybody who's considering to sell. Wow. Well, well. So, the, you know, you mentioned um, the whole Airbnb thing or buying a property abroad, they're living here. How... How does one, what are your opinions about becoming a landlord and how best to accomplish that, especially as a first time buyer? Mm -hmm. I mean, becoming a landlord is a good thing because for me, what that shows, it shows that you are, you're not only just, because I said, you remember, let's just go back, just let's cap a little bit. When we spoke the last time about how to buy your first property on, on part one, we mentioned that your home, your own home that you live in is not an investment. Your own home that you live in is a liability because it takes money out of you. But if you are to be a landlord, what that means is that there's someone who's paying your debt. And I actually love tenants for me personally because anybody who's a tenant for me, they actually pay my own debt. They actually pay my own lending. So that essentially means that they actually, my property out there, they pay for it. I don't have to worry about uh, servicing the property. Whatever they pay, pays the mortgage or whatever lending I have. And also as well, I put some on the side. So 
being a landlord is a very good thing and I would encourage anybody who may want to consider that um, to go down that path, but just ensure that if you are to go down that path, you've done your research very well, you have someone who's mentoring you very well, so you are fully aware of what, um, what, 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 what feels there on the way and, and you can prepare yourself. Okay, okay. Um, Isa, the, it's come up again. How do you make the most out of a help to buy Isa um, as a couple? Um, I, I mean, in so far as ice is a consent, uh, that's not my field, I'll be really honest, but I would imagine that if you are saving through an ISA, um, they, you know, you, they, there's, a, there's, there's some interest that you gain out of it or that you get out of it. And uh, it's just about how you manipulate whatever savings you have and the interest you get uh, to using that as a form of a deposit. But clearly as far as um, manipulating ISAs, um, that's probably not, I'm not the best person to advise on that area okay um how much longer would it be to save for a property while still renting compared to moving back home and saving well i think it's a it's a bit it's a no-brainer though isn't it because if you're living at home and mom and dad were still alive you know and 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 which is which is a blessing and they can, if they can have you and you're behaving very well when you're with them, you are in a position where you can be able to save as much as long as you are contributing on utilities here and there. But if you're renting, the outlay is such that you've got your, your rental to pay, your rent to pay, um, it maybe is cut out more as compared to being at home. But I'll say that you save a lot more if you're at home as opposed to when you were living on your own. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't save money. You can save money. And saving money is all about mindset. Mm. And um, um, how you cut off certain things that really you don't need. As we mentioned in the last presentation on how to save money, that look, you know what, look out, look out on things that really you, you need to cut off. If you're working towards a plan, work towards a plan and set your eyes and goals on it, you'll be absolutely good to go. Mm, definitely. If a person doesn't have enough for a deposit, um, would you still tell them or, or not tell them, but mention or make the point that renting would still be seen as dead money? It, it is what it is. Uh, well, whether they got enough deposit or they didn't have much deposit, it still doesn't change the fact. It still remains as, 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 as dead money. I think the encouragement really here is, is that at some point when resources and opportunities are permitting, um, try and uh, transition from being a tenant to actually owning your own property. And that's, 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 that's a, re a really good advice and good way to go and look at it. Because um, I, don't, I wouldn't want to encourage anybody to stay and remain a tenant because the idea is about ownership. We spoke last time and actually we spoke about one of the counsels that Sister White actually gives us uh, from, uh, from stewardship that uh, the innate need and desire to own to own land and property is actually a, a, a desire given us by God. And we need to understand that uh, when we acquire land, when we acquire property, it is actually a blessing from God. And when God leads us in that direction, uh, God wants us to own. God doesn't want us to be the ones that are uh, paying other people's debts. We'd rather have other people paying our debts and servicing them for us. And that's what God would have us do. But it's about being clever and, and do, but you've got to start somewhere. So don't be frustrated if you were renting, thinking, oh, you know what, I'm just paying dead money and I'm never going anywhere. You've got to start somewhere. Have a plan. Give yourself a target. If it's a five year plan, a two and a half year plan, work towards it. If you're facing the right direction, all you need to do is walk. Okay. So check this out. I've got this. Um, what, what would you say about the person who was, I was in discussion with a friend of mine the other day. Yes. And, um, there was the point, a point came up about buying land so you can buy an acre of yeah. land for about 10,000 pounds. Mm. They saying, just get a few acres and build a, um, and get, get a yurt. You know, those circle, like 10 things that you can put up as a temporary mm. type of permanent type of house. What would you, what would you, what do you think about those? Find some acres, getting a year. You 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 can't you can't go you can't go wrong. Um, on Craig, you can't go wrong. And I think the last presentation is where we spoke about land banking, mm. where anybody owns land, land never depreciates. 
lend always accrues and gains value. So I would say that if there's, um, they, 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 for example, if you just go online right now and check and check our local auctions, you will notice that they sell lands. Our local councils, um, whether it be Birmingham, Wolverhampton, Coventry, um, Telford, or Berkshire, they sell those. What you will find is that. Uh, you can add value on buying a piece of land. If it's on brown land, it's better still because brown land, you can always get planning. Yeah, it's, it's relatively easier to get planning on brown land as opposed to green land because green land is just going to be, it's a, it's a tall mountain to climb and probably you won't get anything. But when you buy land or buy uh, land where garages are built and you knock them, out and knock, knock them off and, and, and get planning. So for example, if you bought... Hypothetically, I'm just giving you an example here. If you bought a piece of land, Craig, worth about £20,000, if you cleared that land, you got planning on that piece of land to build two houses on that, how much do you think that, that, that land would be worth with planning? Mm. Mm. It'd be worth five times more. Yeah. So, so that's what we're talking about in terms of uh, generating and leveraging on land, that you earn more when you let when you own land and when you get planning five times more the value that you would have uh, expended when you bought the property the pro that particular property as opposed to a to a house something to think about thank you it's an excellent point somebody's asked could you give them the quote that you you mentioned from spirit of prophecy about ellen white mentioning buying land or i'm quite i'm quite happy to um i'll, I'll check on the comments and i'll just give them a specific section on, uh, on stewardship, yes, okay. definitely. Um, so the person who asked that question, if you could maybe email um, Marvin and he'll get that. I, I can, I can. In fact, actually, even the, 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 other, the, other easier, the other easier way also as well of locating that, if you just go onto the EG White uh, estate or writings and just type uh, types on, on search, on the search section, just type, um, just type and just ask a question about uh, buying land and property all sister white's views and comments on land this is why we all have to understand this brothers and sisters is that our view and our scope and agenda on buying land and property as a church has always been something that we've always done if you ever look at the 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 amount the vast amount of land that our church owns not only just in americas in the uk in europe in australia i mean what the church owns in, in australia is absolutely mind-blowing and there is, an, there is an encouragement to all of us that as we own these lands, that, that, that we, we, it doesn't only add value to us with our families, but also ultimately when we depart from this earth, we can leave these to the church and that further, that further takes God's work uh, ahead. Well, thank you. Um, so... For everybody who's watching, uh, we'll be closing in, in a few moments. So we'll just close up with the, the last few questions that we've got, Marvin, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's some points about renting. So what if somebody's renting a property? What advice would you give to them about approaching the landlord to buy the property from the landlord? Um, yeah, well, I mean, if, if, there's, um, if there's an opportunity and an option to buy, absolutely you can uh, nothing should stop you there uh, but um, also be careful because they may they may they may you know inflate a price there because you are there already as a sitting tenant but uh, it's always different for example if somebody was renting a property from a housing association if somebody was renting a property from a local council mm -hmm. if an opportunity uh, and the right to buy avails and comes over to that particular individual, there's a massive benefit. Now, the, best, the benefit they have is this, that all the rentals that you've been paying, for example, say you've been living in a property for the last two years of that housing association, and that housing association extends the arm, to, the arm for you to purchase the property. All the rents that you've been paying for the last two and a half years are actually used as part of your deposit and they are discounted from the price when you purchase the property. So there's an advantage there. There's a, there's a, there's a business case to be heard. If you're buying it from a council, if you're buying it from a local housing association, but if it's a private landlord, 
whatever rents you've been paying for the last two and a half years, they don't matter. Wow. Something to think about. Yeah. Thanks. Um, it's, it's an interesting one. Did, I mean, maybe if you, you're in good terms with the landlord, maybe you could negotiate with them. And you could negotiate. Yeah, yeah. You could negotiate. You could negotiate. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we've got two, two last questions. What are your views on rent to rent property strategy? Is it a good idea? You see, I'll be really honest. The rent to rent strategy is simply somebody who is a tenant making money out of that particular property while they're paying the landlord. It's just a posh way of subletting. It's just a posh way of subletting. Mm -hmm. It's like um, with the, this Airbnb that we're talking about, Craig. That is just a push way of a, of a, of a bed and breakfast. It's, it's, it's just, it's just the only difference is that with an Airbnb, you, you are there, you do it yourself. Whereas a bed and breakfast, someone fixes breakfast for you and you wake up in the morning, you're downstairs, you serve breakfast. But with a rent to rent scheme, always ensure if you are intending to do that, make sure that the clause is on your, on your, on your, on your terms of, uh, on your tenancy agreement, actually allow you to do that. If, they allow you to do that you are in breach and there may be legal ramifications so always check out the the the, the clauses on your tenancy agreement to say that they do give exception or that if they don't then be very careful i would say don't do it but if it allows you to do it and there's an option for you to do it by all means it's another way of generating money but be, be, remember that once you rent a property and they're renting off you you have sole responsibility that in case there is any property damage or anything that goes wrong, you take on responsibility. Mm, definitely, definitely. Last question. Um, what about a property that's near hospitals? 10 minute walk away, for example. And I'll probably add into the question, hospitals, schools, railways, railway stations, sorry. Um, what, what, what's your thoughts on properties that are near those places? I think there's nothing wrong with properties near hospitals. Um, some people prefer to have convenience. There are some people who work in hospitals and would prefer to live close to where they work and they walk. Um, there are some people who prefer to be close to a train station so that then when they jump off a train station, they just walk and they don't have any you know, huge traveling um, you know, distances to go. So there's nothing wrong with that. There's some people who prefer to be closer to a school because instead of walking long distances or jumping into a car, driving their children, some people prefer to be near a good schools and we can't knock on them on that. So you will find that um, I mentioned last time, actually, um, I think I did, Craig, I think I can't remember. So remind me if I did, if I didn't, then that's fine. Um, I mentioned the last time when we, when we did the first presentation on uh, buying your first property that there are certain supermarkets like Waitrose. So for example, if you buy a property which is closer to Waitrose, the property value on that property is actually higher. Because, I don't know, it's, it's just the way that, 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 that the, the, this model has been built around that where there's the Waitrose, uh, it's affluent and people, uh, the values on properties are good. Um, whereas if it's somewhere further than that, the prices, they, I, I saw a documentary about a property in Bournemouth where a property facing the sea uh, in Bournemouth uh, was um, 75,000 cheaper than a property that was inland next to, to a Waitrose, which was uh, 75,000 uh, pounds higher. But being close to a hospital, being close to a school or a train station, there's nothing wrong with that. Mm, yeah. It's just, just something that you just have to deal with, with uh, the influx of people passing uh, in front of your property or they decide to park in front of your house because they don't want to pay parking charges in a hospital. But that's, that's another conversation. Definitely, definitely. Um, again, Marvin, I want to say thank you um, for your time, for just the, the guidance that you've shared with everybody tonight. Um, for those of you who have joined us in this Zoom call, and we thank you for just joining tonight um, to participate. We thank you for your questions. And again, if, they, if you do have more questions, please do send it to us. Send an email over to Marvin if you, and, and you said, um, is it Lesedi? Yeah, they said it movie, yeah, that's, she's my PA, so she'll be quite happy to uh, get as many questions and she'll respond on my behalf and she'll support you as well. Yeah, I thought, I, I saw her, she's quick in the chat room as well, so I want to say thank you, Lesedi, um, for, for your assistance today. 
Um, so yeah, we're very grateful for the presentation. I'm guessing if, if you'd like to see maybe a part three on, on a specific topic within um, property, uh, maybe we could do that as well, Marvin. Yeah, I, th I think so. I th I th let's, let, let's do it, Craig. And we can talk about then the, um, the help to buy schemes. We can talk about uh, uh, maybe looking at investment properties. So mm -hmm. buying your first property is different uh, compared to buying an investment property. Uh, we can look at BMVs. We can look at so, there's so many things that we can look into. So um, I'm quite happy to be your assistance. And thank you for allowing me to come into people's spaces and, and share and share what we, we've experienced as well. Definitely, definitely. Thank you. And thank you for the, um, the willingness to be able to come back again, Marvin. Um, I'm sure okay. you'll be back very soon. And again, I do want to let people know, everybody who's watching, Marvin's not just a property investor and, and software um, uh, supporter for other companies. He's also a preacher. So if you need a preacher at your church or over Zoom under the Sabbath, contact him. He preach a good service. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Um, without further ado, what I'll say, Marvin, is if you could maybe close with prayer. Um, pray for everybody yes. who's online, who's maybe looking into getting a property, maybe for the first time or giving advice to somebody else. If you could pray for us, that would be fantastic. Okay, let, let us pray. So, dear Jesus, thank you, Lord, for guiding and protecting us. And thank you, Lord, for uh, giving us an opportunity, Lord, to share these little nuggets of uh, wisdom and experiences that will help us along the way. My prayer, Lord, for all the young people and everybody that has been uh, engaged on this program is that, Lord, never to fear, to trust that, Lord, you can help us to take the first step, the first uh, walk and walk with us through um, gaining and amassing uh, the blessings, Lord, that you have in store for us with land and properties for your glory. Guide us and be with us, Lord, this evening and with our families. Until we meet again, I pray and I lift the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you again, Marvin. And just before we do leave this evening, I just want to remind you all that there is no program tomorrow, um, but we will be having the book club, which takes place this Thursday, 8 p.m. until 8.45, I think. And then on Friday, there will be the Bible study this week. So, and that will be at 8 o'clock until 9 o'clock. So thank you again, for everyone. Um, have a good evening, and then we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Cheers, thank you.